When my father and Fritz Lang did M, I imagine I must have been around eight years old, and I remember my father taking me onto the set. And of course, I was fascinated by these underworld figures. I remember the scene in the in that nightclub in the cellar with the prostitutes and all these painted women. And I remember Fritz Lang didn't like the looks of an ashtray. And he had a cigar, and he stopped production while he built up the ashes himself by puffing on the cigar and building up the ashes. Then he moved the ashtray around, he added some cigarette butts, and we resumed shooting when it was perfect. I mean, he was that, that, that sort of a perfectionist. And I do remember the way he talked to the people on the set. I mean, nobody in America would dare talk to actors the way he did. I mean, he was a, an autocratic director in the true German sense. The genesis of Nero Films is really in the butter and egg business. Sometime after World War I in the early 20s, my grandfather Henry, my father Seymour, went to Europe, ostensibly to visit the relatives. They were introduced to Harry Peel, who was the German Douglas Fairbanks. And they told him, listen, you come from America, you have some money, why don't you put money into films? They're just starting here. And my grandfather started to finance a number of Harry Peel pictures, of silent pictures, of course. My father took over the production reins. It was pretty much a family business. And in spite of that, it became the only real competition for Ufa. Nero Films made pictures that were internationally known. M, Testament of Dr. Mabuza, also directed by Fritz Lang, the Beggar's Opera, a G.W. Pops picture, West Front 1918, a Pops picture. And when you had men of uh, the stature of, of a Fritz Lang or a, or a G.W. Pops, uh, you gave them free reign. Nero became very much what we have today, a, a mini major or a major without a plant. And by virtue of the material that was chosen, and the directors that were chosen, they made pictures of revolutionary social import. In the case of M, the concept that a criminal could actually be the prisoner of his own pathology, you know, this was a novel thought. Up until that time, I think the masses believed a guy who killed children should be killed in turn. It may not be a bad idea, but there are, but there are other underpinnings which today we have accepted. Pandora's box is another example of a revolutionary picture of the time, which touched on lesbianism, and that was typical for for the Nero pictures of the period. Whereas Ufa made. Uh, uh, pictures of the German kings, of uh, great court dances, uh, the swashbucklers, that sort of thing. When the test of Dr. Mabuse was completed. The Nazis were already in power. Fritz Lang said to my father, he says, don't worry about a thing. Dr. Goebbels is a great personal friend of mine, and we will get the okay. This picture will pass the, will pass the censorship board. Well, it didn't. There was a to-do about it. They wanted some deletions. Fritz Lang was called into the office of Dr. Goebbels, who was the head of the Rice Film Chamber. 
And according to Fritz Lang, he was offered the helm of the German film industry position. Fritz Lang said that he was so terrified at the prospect of this offer that he immediately went to the railroad station and went to Paris. His maternal grandmother was Jewish, and he was afraid that that may rule against him. He came to Paris, immediately invented himself as a great anti-Nazi, and never went back to Germany. There was an amusing corollary to this, that at the Berlin Cinémathèque, they have his passport. And the passport gives you living proof that after this initial meeting with Dr. Goebbels, he went back to Germany innumerable times to set his affairs in order, to get his money out of the bank, etc., etc. So this whole, his whole background is a little questionable. And I think this led to an eventual misunderstanding between Fritz Lang and my father here in Los Angeles. In the early 30s, you could hear Hitler's speeches on the radio almost every week. And I remember, even as a little boy, sitting at my father's table for dinner with guests, and he would say to his friends, he says, listen, get your affairs in order and get out of here because this is going to take a bad turn. And uh, my father, you know, thought or said, he says, you know, I'm an American, I can leave here whenever I choose, but you people are going to be in trouble. My father put the negative of the testament of Dr. Mabuza into the trunk of his Mercedes SS and happily drove over the German-Dutch border to Paris, and that was it. In Paris, he made a series of very commercial pictures. The Le Roi des Champs-Élysées, the king of the Champs-Élysées, with Buster Keaton, made a very beautiful picture called Les Otages, the Hostages, a picture about the First World War, which ran at the 50th History Playhouse for months on end. My father had a billet at MGM under Louis B. Mayer, and he made one picture called We Who Are Young, with Lana Turner. And my father had a very good relationship with Louis B. Mayer, but uh, he was not made to work in the studio system. And after a couple of years, he struck out for his own again. I did work with my father actively on one picture that was the remake of M, where I was associate producer, which had been rewritten for Los Angeles. My father had worked with Peter Laurie in this country. He made a picture here in Hollywood called The Chase. But I think when it came to casting M, we wanted to Americanize the picture entirely. And to have used Peter Lorre would not have worked. Not only because of the accent, but because of the slightly over-the-top European way of expressing himself, which was ideal for, for that time, that period. Uh, I think to make it acceptable to an American audience, you had to tone that thing way, way down. David Wayne, who's a great actor, was a wonderful choice. He anglicized it, he made that role understandable, and by and large, although it was difficult, I think we did a fairly good job in bringing this picture into an American background and making it work. I think one interesting aspect of the production was that it was photographed to a large degree in a section of Los Angeles that has basically ceased to exist. Bunker Hill at one time must have been a rather grand neighborhood because it consisted of these wonderful old American clapboard houses, some of them three stories high, and they had all, all been converted into rooming houses. Uh, they were approaching the slum condition at the time when we were shooting there. It had a feeling which you couldn't get anyplace else in Los Angeles. Shortly thereafter, the, the city removed Bunker Hill. It's a history of Los Angeles. And that version of M was sort of part of it. That's been recorded on film. Joe Losey, 
He directed the picture, and he managed to bring, ungenerously, I would call it a cell, a communist cell, into the picture. Others may say collaborators. I say a communist cell. I remember I went to the opening with my father at the Paramount Theater on Hollywood Boulevard. And as we came out, the American Legion was out there in, in full force, carrying signs, a communist picture, reds. Columbia, you know, brave and heroic, like all major studios, they yanked that picture quicker than you can say Jack Robinson. And it was off the screen and never saw the light of day again in the United States. I think that pretty much spelled the end of my father's career. I remember my father was interviewed by the Los Angeles tablet, and they said, Mr. Nebenzoe, come clean with us. What organizations do you belong to? And my father said, I belong to two organizations, the Automobile Club of Southern California and the Hollywood YMCA. <laughs> which really was true, because my father was the ultimate entrepreneur and uh, with very few sympathies, you know, for the active left. And we were suckered into the situation. We were innocents in those days, like a lot of people. Sometimes people ask me if, if I feel that M is a true reflection of the times in Germany. Uh, those days of the Weimar Republic, when unemployment was high, uh, when everything seemed dark and hopeless. Yes, those were probably the darkest days in post-war German history. But I think M, other than the psychological aspects of explaining to an audience the pathology of, of a pedophile, other than that, I think the picture is just a great entertainment. A great entertainment more than a social document. There may have been a feeling that German society, that by that we mean the, the bourgeois middle class, that they wanted order. And this may have led to the election of Hitler, who was legitimately elected. But uh, I don't think it's the cocaine, I don't think it's the prostitutes, I don't think it's the, the illicit high life that supposedly was practiced by the artistic classes. I think unemployment called the tune. I think that perhaps Nero Films was the forerunner of the concept of independent productions in the American sense. By that I mean not an individual who makes a picture. Granted, that is an independent production, but an independent production in the sense of United Artists, of raising financing for independent pictures. My grandfather was a true pioneer pulled his butter and egg money out of his pocket to go into film production and who made it work. My father's legacy is part of motion picture history. He made some of the really most important pictures, especially the Fritz Lang and the W. Paps pictures. Now in the sunset of my years, uh, I receive uh, young graduates of film schools from the world over who come to see me and who want to reinvent or rediscover that period, that period of the 30s when these great films were made. <laughs>